Today I have with me Miss Hayley Rice, who's a child and adolescent psychotherapist. It's been a real struggle not to have any before recording conversations because the whole arena of children and parenting is huge for me. I often would speak about how I do love my 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 skincare job. I love what I do, but being a mom is without doubt the favourite job I have. And the one I do believe that will have the most impact long term. Um, so I'm so excited. Like I said, Hayley, hopefully I'll have you on many times because it's a huge arena and there's so many areas that I want to cover. But your, your area of child expertise, um, talk to us about what a positive parent parent relationship has on a child and what is a positive parent relationship. I kind of feel with parenting, we're all just winging it. So tell me what that positive relationship looks like in your opinion. Oh yeah, it's a great question to start with. And I think the winging it part is okay. Like it's natural, isn't it? To not know yeah. everything. But for me, like I studied the parent-child relationship and that's where most of my work is actually, helping parents to connect, reconnect with their child and to enhance that relationship and I love thinking of it as, you know, there's the parent, there's the child, and then there's the relationship as a third thing they've got to work on. And really parenting is relationshiping. And it's a very unique, very, very um, ever-changing uh, kind of triggering relationship to have because it's, you know, this little person that you love so much, but you want to protect, but they're they're changing on the daily. Yeah. And you're trying to evolve with them. And it's yeah. just, it's so complex. So, yeah, yeah I think... I think let's <laughs> let's go right back there because it kind of brings us right to the beginning. And I think it's probably the area where most people struggle with how you're given this baby on the day you give birth. And that little separate entity, that little person is constantly changing. And I think as a parent, that's where we kind of struggle mm -hmm. because with all of those changes, we have to also let go of the little girl or the little boy we had as they go on to school and then you have other people, their judgments of your child, how they'll interact socially, you should let go even more. You know, Heidi, I actually even struggled with when they grow out of their best from three to six months mm. and then go into their six to 12. I was like, how do I let go of that fest? I was, you know, mm -hmm. I'm never going to know that little child again as you merge into the next one. So I guess there has to be that element of acceptance and that, I think once a parent realised that the child is meant to change and meant to evolve mm -hmm. and every day you could have a new human in your house literally you know I love that concept of the relationship being separate because yeah. that is so true mm -hmm. you, it is a separate entity it's its own thing and it's evolving all the time and you're interacting with it whether you're intentional or not mm. so when you start being intentional about how's that relationship going how's my child evolving changing um, and I think naturally enough when, when, when a person when a parent or a set of parents or foster parents or whatever mm -hmm. you know adoptive parents when there's going to be a new baby there's this um, imagined mm -hmm. future imagined baby my baby will be so this and they're going to love the things I love and you know they're going to be just like me or they're going to be exactly like their daddy or we're going to always be happy and our yeah. family will be beautiful <laughs> but actually they're yeah. going to be tantruming there's going to be sleepless nights there's going to be stressors in your life that come in to the relationship then because you've got to go to work yeah. your child's like but mommy so yeah. it's it's just kind of being aware of like what are my expectations yeah. and then I always say to parents meet your child where they're at okay. versus you know I want them to be this or you know they're, they're so naughty lately why are they doing this where but like well developmentally they're two so are they naughty or are they going through something they need to and that's part of their evolution and you know, meeting yeah. them there yeah so always bringing yourself back into just into the present with the relationship I think yeah and I think it's been really mindful of I guess because I can I can see and I, of course I was that mom where when they were really naughty and I was trying to stop that behavior mm. or, or control that behavior but yet like you're saying there was something going on at that point for that little kid so I guess you have to kind of take a step away from yourself and realize what is it going on with them what's their needs exactly and that's the main thing I think is I think a lot of parents that I work with they get a lot out of the idea of reframing so when a child is naughty in inverted commas there's something they're doing something they're behaving maybe they're in a power struggle with you mm -hmm. doesn't matter what age they are um when when you initially look and go oh it's so bold or why are they doing this? You know, they're trying to annoy me or what's happening yeah. here. When you reframe it to, ooh, I'm curious. Yeah. This is behavior I haven't seen before. Or hold on a second. Could this be a leap or a stage of development? You know, the three nature. Is it, is it, are they hungry? <laughs> like yeah. curiosity Yeah. rather than the judgment piece of they shouldn't be doing this. Okay. So it's it's a totally different like perspective shift. Yeah. And I guess to look beyond the, beyond the behavior. 
exactly. and see what's going on. Yeah, Beyond Behaviour, that's what Mona Della Hook says. Um, if you've read her books, she's amazing. She always talks yeah. about what's underneath, what's going on in the nervous system, what's okay. going on developmentally. And that's the key, really, to yeah. be able to connect with it yeah. and, and help them through it rather than have ruptures in the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Which then can obviously manifest as the relationship goes on and yeah. struggles can, can continue. Because I would imagine... Um, I would imagine that initially you have those struggles obviously with little people, let's say zero to five. Mm-hmm. But as they grow into adolescence, those struggles must take on a new dimension. As in you've someone here, well in my case, who's taller than you. Mm. And, um, you know, she's only 12. And, mm. you know, trying to have that kind of battle. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I think definitely you're laying the foundations for your relationship mm. and you're laying the foundations for your connection. You're mm-hmm. laying the foundations for how we communicate. Mm-hmm. How do we do big feelings in our house? It's not that everyone has to be always good. Yeah. You know, do we want our kids always to comply? Yeah. A bit of pushback is like, that's what's going to get them to go to their boss and say, I'm not happy with this. Or, yeah. you know, to, to leave yeah. a party at 16 and say, I don't like this. Yeah. We want them to have a voice. Yeah. But I think some parents don't want that. They want to control it, like you say, or shut yeah. it down. So I think you're definitely laying the foundations for that relationship um, in the early years and trying to grow it up with your child as they're as they're changing. But I definitely think it's never too late to change it either or to repair okay. little ruptures and to, to change the way you um, communicate. Definitely not. Yeah. You know, interesting because I kind of struggle with saying I'm sorry to the girls. And the reason for this is if something happens, like I'm obviously coming from a good place Mm -hmm. and they will ask for an apology and almost demand one. And I'm like, but I'm actually not sorry. So where do you stand on that? You know, I'm happy to meet you somewhere in the middle, but I'm not sorry that this has all happened because, Mm. you know, like, do you you think, yes, we should be willing to apologise? Is that teaching them to be, to apologise? Like, it depends on the situation. I don't think there's a blanket answer for that but in in relationship kind of studies and things and the the work I do we have you know the idea of uh, the one third rule so one third of the time the parent hopefully is attuning and giving good enough parenting and attunement and caregiving one third of the time there's ruptures so you're going to have a fight you're going to you know not attuned to their needs you're dismissing them whatever that's okay it's normal and one third of the time is for repairing okay. good quality repair means that you're saying sorry being authentic mm-hmm. owning up to something if you feel you need to mm-hmm. and saying sorry without the but so it's not I'm sorry but you were out of order and I asked you ten times it's just like I'm sorry you shouted can yeah. we start over that's completely different Yeah. Um. at the same time like I think if you're authentic and you're thinking well I'm actually not sorry i I. I don't like what happened between us. Yeah. Maybe that's a bigger conversation yeah. then. It's like, I feel like I don't yeah. want to say sorry. I'll be honest with you. I feel yeah. my stuff is that I don't really want to say sorry because this happened and X, Y, Z and you said, so what will we do? Yeah. What do? And maybe your child then will say, well, oh yeah, I can see your point of view, mom. Maybe yeah. we both need to say sorry. Is that better? Like, yeah. you know, it's it's not, um, I think as they're older, it's more complex and you can, but I love that idea of using I statements. Rather than you're always making me and okay. you're telling me to say sorry to you, but you did this. It's like, I didn't yeah. like how you spoke to me. Yeah. I felt yeah. upset by you. I felt angry and I actually don't think I'm ready to say sorry yet. Or, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's totally yeah. different. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess teaching them to own their feelings. Mm. I know with the girls, I, you know, they, they, when they were younger, they'd say things to me like, oh, you made me sad, you made me angry. And I'd say to them, actually, it's physically impossible for me to make you anything. You've mm-hmm. chosen to be mm-hmm. sad for whatever reason and you've so chosen to be angry mm-hmm. over a situation. So I said, you know, if it's not sitting well with you, why don't you reconsider how things are going to play out and we can turn this around. Mm-hmm. But now, of course, if I, they, they throw that right back at me, which is good. I'm glad that they're using that tool. But yeah, I'm like, wow, delight. I covered that with them. <laughs> but I'm a great believer in giving them back their power yeah. because I think... As people in society today, everyone is trying to remove power Mm. from us. You know, people don't like that. So I think if you can give them that tool, if they're ever even in a place without you, they'll just take their power back and own their own feelings and realize that, let's say, I'm thinking, of course, of, you know, boyfriend in years to come that, no, he actually can't make me sad. I've chosen Mm. to be sad Mm. and now I can choose not to be or he can't make me anxious. He can't make me any of those things. I've only I have that button to press. Yeah. And it's so empowering. I think one of the things I love working with families on is having making sure the child feels they have a voice yeah so it's, and I think that's that's difficult where you know some of the strategies that typically have been used in mainstream parenting and over the years and 
you know, the boomers, how they were parent is to shut down behaviour. Yeah. Stop uh, yeah. that, don't speak, you yeah. know, go to your room. Like it's closing it all yeah. down yeah. versus saying like, I, I'm curious about how, you, you know, use your voice. We can be respectful, but, yeah. Yeah. you know, and opening up the actual feeling and yeah. the conversation about it. Yeah. yeah. I know moms and dads, I'm sure, struggle a lot with um like that seeing their, their babies turn into peri-teens and then teenagers, et cetera, et cetera. But I would imagine, and of course, as we spoke about your area of expertise is in the child and the adolescent's emotions. How must that feel for them? You know, those ch- changes. Sometimes I think my girls might be a little bit sad that they're getting bigger and they're losing mm-hmm. that kind of cuddle. Not that they can obviously cuddle any time they want, but I know they feel that and they like to go back into that babyish Mm, kind of place mm. it's a place obviously that brings them comfort and makes them feel safe yeah um, and who wouldn't grab that any opportunity that they can but h- how would you feel that the, ch- the child is managing those emotions are feeling what's it like for them to, to grow up really yeah I think I'm so glad you brought this up because I don't think people think of that yeah but it is a massive thing and mm. I think it's a it's a it's such a big transition and it's you know kids will definitely like with any transition they'll go between like oh yeah I want to like go away mom I don't need you I'm off with my friends they're more important and then they could be literally can I have a hug will you get into bed with me I need you it's that kind of it's similar you know 12 13 is similar to toddler where it's like no go away and then I need you I want you to pick me up now so it's it's kind of this um pendulum swinging of in and out Uh, but it it is really hard for kids to process that and to you know so I think like for me, it all goes back to the attachment relationship. Okay. And if you think of, you know, when you first ever held your babies mm-hmm. and you're you're giving them so much eye contact and you're holding them, it's all touch, touch, touch. It's nurturance, you're feeding. Um, it's all rhythmic. It's very hard to pick up a baby and stay still. Yeah. How weird. We just immediately yeah. start, ba ba ba, and we talk in this reciprocal. They say ba ba ba, and they you go ba ba ba, and it's the tone of your voice. All of those things helped your baby to thrive yeah. and turn into the person they are because it's um it's kind of the attachment. It tells the brain I'm safe, the nervous system, the cells, the felt safety in the body. Yeah. So children need touch like they need water. It it does the need for that attachment stuff yeah. and that input doesn't stop as they get older, but they naturally move away. And yeah. we have to like say let them go away. Yeah. But they'll still need that yeah. touch. And when they're 18, they still need it. Yeah. When they're 15, but they're not climbing up into your lap. Yeah. So it's I think it's so important to bear that in mind as they get older. You know, and especially if you feel the relationship's a bit off or they're yeah. being a bit cheeky or attitude. Yeah. I'm like, well, go in with the touch, go right. in with the eye contact, go in with delighting yeah. in them. Yeah. So for me, that's true play usually. But for adolescents and stuff, when they're coming to you and they're wanting to cuddle, yeah. it's, it's that, it, they're looking for the attachment again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. And my two, I'm lucky in the sense that they're very tactile, so it's easy to address that. But mm. I'm just thinking, you know, those, maybe I'm thinking my broad family, nieces, nephews, etc. those boys that maybe are a little bit more sterile and, and mm. step back. But I guess maybe just to find whatever their button is mm-hmm. and be sure to press it. Even if it's just a phone call, even if it's just yeah. a breakfast in the morning and a little chat over breakfast. Yeah. You know, I think, um, and I know because obviously I work on parents you know, when they're in the clinic, the biggest struggle as well is the kids when they're suffering, you know, if they're having mm. rows with, with friends, you know, particularly around the age of 12, 14, it can have a massive impact. Their relationship with their friends at that point seems yeah. to be more impactful emotionally than with their parents, which mm-hmm. is probably why you may feel a moving away from you. Um, how, how can you navigate that? Because it is really, really difficult mm-hmm. to, you know, because you want to tell them, you know, she's just leave her alone, she's fine. But you can't dismiss it either. No, and, and that's really, really important not to dismiss because in adolescence, like, I think a lot of parents, you know, you have the app for when there's a new baby and you know the leaps, mm-hmm. you know, oh, they should be rolling over by now or they're, mm-hmm. they're having their sleep regression. But when they're going through adolescence, it's it's at a stage of development and mm-hmm. all these changes are happening in the body and the brain. And so it's so rapid mm-hmm. um, and so risky behavior. And my my friends being more important, um, me wanting you to just go away. You're so annoying. That kind of all the moods, mm-hmm. the hormones kick in. And then it's also, um, you know, how does the parents still stay connected in that? And how do we help them through like? What, mm-hmm. what you're saying mm-hmm. uh, Annie you know to not dismiss mm-hmm. but I think the number one thing is to acknowledge their feelings and you know it might seem like they're 
overreacting like it's the worst thing in the world that their jeans aren't dry because now they have to wear the other jeans yeah. and if, oh sure for God's sake it's fine you know yeah. rather than oh you're really upset about that you yeah. really don't want to wear those jeans oh no like empathise feel right. with them yeah. rather than just deal with them yeah. you know and get in there as if yeah I really I really feel like you'd, you're so upset about these jeans so yeah. that's support that's um, connection um, similarly then you know if, if, if you're keeping the conversations open, you're not trying to dive in and fix. Yeah. That's really hard. Yeah. If they're like, you know, I've got this person who's excluding me out of the group or whatever is happening. Yeah. Um, I think unless it's, you're really worried and unless it's bullying or it, it looks like something mm-hmm. that a parent needs to advocate mm-hmm. for a child and step in for mm-hmm. safety. Other than that, you're just supporting them, stepping back and allowing them come to their own mm. Um conclusions hopefully yeah and 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 being a sounding board rather than here's what you should do yeah I told you already you shouldn't have done that this is what you should have done why didn't you do what I said yeah you know and it's yeah. lecturing versus yeah. like whoa yeah. that sounds really hard what do you think yeah <laughs> no? and I, I think you know it can be a parent's it's a real struggle because you want to fix everything you want everything to be right for them you idolise this child but the reality is not everyone's going to idolise them the way you do and they're going yeah. to come up against stuff in life so I guess it's to give them back the, the skills yeah to that's manage it. it yeah you're scaffolding them yeah to do it themselves yeah. Yeah. yeah and you know really you know like I said to you that a whole inner child I think sometimes when you're raising children it can trigger your inner mm-hmm. child you maybe happenings or traumas that occurred in your in your childhood there's that and then there's also to be mindful that you're creating a future adult's inner child mm. with all the happenings that are going on in your house today. I think, you know, it is a big responsibility to realise that when when you're possibly gone, this 40-year-old man or woman or 50-year-old man or woman, things that happen in your home today will mm. still affect them. Mm-hmm. Maybe talk to us about, you know, that kind of like trauma in childhood or even sometimes it's not even like trauma you think a big happening maybe that 999 were called it's not necessarily something huge like that it can be the small Mm -hmm. everyday occurrences that create that kind of trauma yeah and I think that's a scary thing for for people to think about but I I do want to emphasize that you don't have to be perfect you can't always have a gorgeous happy home like I mentioned the one third rule comes in all the time but yeah you're right it is really important to look out for those things and if you find yourself always shouting or you find it's getting yeah. really heightened to seek help or to look and go what's activated in me yes why am I I'm being triggered here yeah. and that's okay I'm human but what is it get curious go yeah. inward like I do so much work with parents on reparenting themselves yeah so acknowledging their inner child is activated as in mom and dad would never have allowed this yeah. so now I'm shouting at my child and those yeah. same sentences that were said to me that I didn't like yeah. are flying out of my my, my mouth yeah um so it's it's very important to be aware of that yeah and um I think kids adolescents all ages they're internalizing mm. they see themselves through their parents eyes mm. how you look at them matters yes under sevens particularly are very very susceptible to that because they're egocentric they think everything's their fault they think mom's upset because of me even if you say you're not okay. so it's very important to be yeah you know careful just and yeah. And and just being curious yeah. rather than not judgmental with yourself if yeah. you're getting heightened in those places, you know, yeah. in that way. You know, what I'm thinking here, the problem's not the problem, it's how you react to the problem. Mm, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, yeah. I guess be mindful that you think there's an issue with, with whatever's triggering you, but how you respond actually could end up being a bigger deal yeah. than what that actual thing and, that was And happening. it is about responding rather than reacting. And yeah. that's really hard. That's going from... You've probably got some childhood trauma yourself or some stressors. You know, there's so many stressors yeah. at the moment for parents. And yeah. even coming off out of COVID is still, yeah. there's a lot of pressure there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when when you're reactive, mm. you know that you're not in a regulated state in your own nervous yeah. system. And if you're dysregulated, you can't help your child to calm and regulate. Yeah. So it really starts with the parent. Yeah. And and it's about looking after yourself, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And not going on empty. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Which is why self care is so important. And mm. um, I know for me, what I would have done it doesn't really happen now, but it didn't happen a huge amount. But I kind of would threaten it. So I created this person called Momster, and basically that's when you lose your shit, right? <laughs> And a lot of times what I would say is, okay, do I need to go momster? Because I can feel her coming. She's brewing and they would cut down whatever's going on. Mm. And they would stop whatever behavior. Momster probably made an appearance about maybe five times (laughs) from zero to ten. Yeah, good times. Good times. (laughs) But now 
honestly, I think I may have traumatized them. And that's OK. Like you said, mm-hmm. we're not all perfect because what I see now as young adults is particularly with the youngest girl who's 12. She'd be like, are you OK, mom? Is, you know, like she can sense if I'm in bad form. You know, if I come in and, and mm-hmm. yep, we all, you know, but she actually can sense it so easily. Mm. And now I wonder, wow, did Mumster really traumatize her? <laughs> Oh, uh, forgive me for, what, <laughs> for my sins. But it's interesting you talk about this alter ego kind right. of. It's like Beyonce, <laughs> Sasha Fierce. Like yeah. but, you know, I just love that for for um, parents to to know that because you have your inner cookie cutter mom who's yeah. like, oh, lovely picture, yeah. and wow, and yeah. we bake today. And yeah. then you have your sergeant major mom who's like, pick up this clothes, and, <laughs> and then you have all the other types. Yeah. So it's just knowing that's a part of you. Yeah. You you've also got to calm nurturing. A yeah. million different parts. Do you know, whereas I, I would meet parents and they say, I'm so shouty or I'm yeah. a terrible mom. I am this. Yeah. You are not. That's not yeah. your identity. There's a part of you that's coming up. Yeah. So when mom, Momster was coming up, she was triggered. There's yeah. a reason. So uh, like, why? You know, be yeah. curious about Momster. What did she, what was she trying to do? Yeah. She was trying to control the situation because she was stressed or she was trying yeah. to, you know, make everything calmer or get a sense of yeah. making this stop what was it it's for a reason mm. that those things come up well for me what would happen is like when something like you know they fight with each other or they don't bring their, put their stuff in the dishwasher or you know their knickers and socks are all over the house right <laughs> and then I'd be like you know what this is good this is about the fifth thing this week you know mm. it would never be one of them anyway it would always be the two of them combined because mm. the two of them would calm I, do you think it's a good idea to separate what I would have found was that well, in my mind, it never happened, obviously, was I had to create Momster because if I was to constantly shout, sure, they wouldn't do anything. Mm. And I'd be worn out and I'd be tired going to work and drained and um, my throat would hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so I just decided, you know what, I'm not going to shout very often, but when I shout, it's going to be real. Mm. And I think like a lot of parents do that. Like they just, they, they don't listen till I shout, so I shout. Yeah. But actually then you're setting the boundary at the yeah. child knows. I don't yeah. have to listen till you shout. Yeah. So you're kind of setting. So sometimes it's about re- Evaluating, yeah. resetting that boundary yeah. um, and, and going in knowing that I tend to get this heightened. I don't want to do that. So what can I do instead? And saying to them like a really good one for siblings. And I would use this in groups as well with kids. Is, like when I say I notice that X, Y and Z is happening. You guys are fighting over this or I've noticed that, you know, the socks are on the ground mm-hmm. and then I get upset. What will we do? Hand it back over to okay. them and go, what do you think? Right, and yeah. and like a lot of the time, kids are like, "I have a plan, Mom. I know. Okay. I think we should do this, or I think we should take turns." And on Tuesdays, she does it. On Wednesdays, yeah. I do it. And you try and make a collaborative yeah. plan together, yeah. versus like, "I have to shout it." There's nothing else that works. Okay, there yeah. is other things that uh, yeah. that can help with that. You know, what well, my two are going at it at the moment, twelve and fourteen. That's the common team now in the house. Is you know in the mornings particularly because they're both agitated, and I get mm. it. So what I say to them is if they speak unkindly to each other, which is the most, my, I remember my parents saying it to us. Mm. It's the most horrible noise a parent can hear is their kids actually killing each other and mm. being mean to each other. So I just say, how would you feel if I spoke to your dad like that? Like only the other day, apparently Grace, our emo was fixing Grace's collar. She said, get your hand off me. I'll do it myself. I said, imagine if your dad fixed my collar and I said, get your hand off me. I'll do it myself. And the two of them were like, oh my oh, God, yeah. it mm. changed everything oh wow yeah. yeah and because as I say I love you two the way each of you love daddy and I equally mm-hmm. so I said it's exactly the same thing yeah yeah and it's it, that's the relationship part isn't it yeah. and I think it's hard though with siblings as well like to try and keep them as allies and friends it's not it's it, there's going to be like that. that's a relationship in itself yeah. with ruptures and repairs and yeah. getting along some of the time and, yeah but you're always kind of trying to nurture it um, yeah. and and have them like feeling like they're a team yeah. versus they're against each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, funny, um, like what I did, but this screensaver, um, people listen can't see, but it's Grace Nemo when they were maybe four and six with their arms around. Ah, That's no. more for me. Yeah. So I can remember at one time they loved each other <laughs> or at least appeared they to. Do. They do. And of course they will again in the future. Yeah. My sisters are my best friends and yeah, my brother. Me too. Um, but I guess that's an, a great example of how you know, kids do constantly transition, constantly mm. evolve. And, you know, sometimes I even say to mums when they're like, oh, you know, she's sleeping, let's say a baby. No, no. I say, how's the sleeping now? Oh, she's great. And in my head, I'm like, well, there's another problem just around the corner. Yeah. Because you just <laughs> feel like something. you get something mastered and boom, you're in the next mm. stage, be it mm-hmm. toilet training or yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And that is the reality of, of raising yeah. kids. Kids are humans. 
So, so they're yeah. going to move through yeah. all these human emotions yeah. and changes yeah. and it's just, yeah, yeah. it's constant. Yeah. What I've noticed now that both of them are in secondary school is just a whole new dimension of issues mm. coming their way that just did not really exist mm. in primary school. And one thing both of them have had to deal with, um, Grace in first year, she's now in third, again in third year, and Emer two is death mm. and the death of a of a fellow student okay, in, in the school. So it's a really hard one for yeah. for me to navigate. Um, and I was wondering, like, also well, I've had to raise the topic of suicide with them mm-hmm. and speak to them about suicide. Mm. Um, I'm going to hand this over, Haley, because like, where do you even go when you're speaking to a 14 year old yeah. about suicide? How would you would recommend a parent deals with that? When because it, it's happened, I suppose they're yeah. they're they're aware of it. Mm-hmm. There's something that's is you talking about? They've it's happened yeah, in the like school, a, kind you of know, a student their age. Yeah, okay, so yeah. to think this could come into their perimeter. I think, like, I would suggest perhaps going at it like, there's a couple of things actually Mm -hmm. that come to mind. Um, Definitely that it's not a one-off conversation. I think when I was growing up, it was like, if there was something big, ooh, something like, we need to talk about something. You were brought into the room. The good sitting room. Yeah, (laughs) sat down and you were told and that was it. And then never talk about it again. (laughs) But, you know, actually, we would talk about fluid communication and, you know, while you're chopping veg going, I wanted to check in with you about what we we spoke about last week. Actually, has it come up for you again? Or is there any other questions you had? So it's ongoing information and it's drip, drip, drip in at a pace that suits them. Mm. Also checking in with the child. What what do you know? What do mm. you understand? So you know the baseline then. Yeah. Like maybe they understand exactly and they understand far more than you knew. But I would always check in with what do you know? What are your questions? Versus here's what I think, you know. Yeah. So just be led and guided by your teen. Um, and then I think the triangular relationship as well. So that's where it's yourself, your teenager or and then you're doing something. So uh, teens are much l- more likely to talk and open up and feel at ease when when they're not actually looking right into your eye. When okay. it's something hard, it okay. can just be a little bit distant. Oh, and the mums too. For sure. So, you know, driving. Drive. Mm-hmm. That's the classic mm-hmm. one. Or, you know, cooking or they're doing something and you're just, oh, yeah, this. So it's casual. It's easy flowing. It's yeah. not something like it's a big deal. And I only can ask mom when we go into the good sitting room, yeah. Do you know, and yeah. there's something we're doing at the same time. It can really ease any, mm. you know, nervousness around talking yeah. about it. But I always think be guided by the team because there's teenagers or 14 year olds who would be very innocent and not have a clue and be very upset and very triggered and all by yeah. hearing anything too much. And yeah. there's others that would be, oh, that's old news. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I know about that. I yeah. heard about that when I was 10 or I've yeah. had another experience of that actually in my family or, do you know, so everyone's yeah. so different. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good point about keeping the conversation fluid because it's not a conversation I'm very comfortable talking about. Mm. I, I feel like my job is to protect them from any kind of hurt and pain. Mm. So I would speak once and never approach it again. Yeah. So that's definitely something that I, I would just check in. Yeah, yeah. Check in and see how they're dealing with it. Mm. Um. And what about grief, you know, maybe a family member or even, you know, if if you know a family ma- member is going to pass away, mm. you know, how would you prepare a child for a loss? How would you speak to a child about loss or about grief? Yeah, it's such a complex topic. It's, it's um, and I work at the Irish Cancer Society a lot mm-hmm. and I work with kids who have cancer and family, they're affected by it. So for me, again, it's so individual and it's very similar. It's about what do they already know? What would they like to know? It's pacing it. Yeah. You know, you're not saying sit down, let me tell you every single thing. Yeah. Um, it needs to be a developmentally appropriate as well. Cause you could again, you could have a 14 year old that's emotionally younger mm. or neurodivergent and and can't mm-hmm. quite access the feelings. Um, I think we we grief and loss expect a range of emotions. Mm-hmm. Expect, you know, some parents were like, Well, they didn't even cry. They seemed fine. Yeah. They kind of got on with it. We're like, yeah. well, no, what's going on under it? Or maybe it'll be for most um people, it's six months to a year before they begin to kind of need maybe therapy or, you know, you're in shock for a lot right. of that time. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I think it's 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 a hard one to answer actually, because yeah. it's yeah. so multifaceted. Yeah. There's great um supports out there you okay. know with the hospice society yeah. and there's um the irish children bereavement network on that site they have yeah. all sorts of resources that parents can access and schools can tend to hopefully be supported um in that process as well yeah um but i guess like you were saying it's just to keep it fluid and to yeah. know that even their grief is transient and is going to change and yeah. evolve as the 
months, weeks, years go by. And it's not linear. It's not this idea of like, oh, they're in the angry phase. Mm. Then they're going to go to acceptance. Or go- that's that's old news now. Mm. It's it's very much they can go in and out of all different feelings. So if you notice they're slamming doors or they're, I would be saying, oh, I wonder if that's a bit of emotion there. That's, you know, yeah. just be a little yeah. bit more generous with yeah. with your interpretation yeah. of their behaviour, you know. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, I think... F- for me with grief, there can be a lot of stigma around it that it's this really bad, nasty, mm. like kind of sadness and nobody ever wants to feel it. I would talk about grief as being an absolute privilege mm. because if you've never, if you if you're grieving, then you've loved. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like love turned inside out and yeah. it's it's very precious to the person grieving and yeah. it's their little ball to hold yeah. and for as long as they want and then if they want to start showing other people parts of it, slowly let it out. Yeah. And then to, because we recently had, um, my uh, my cousin's little boy Adam passed away. He was only eight oh, in the gosh, summer. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was really tragic. He was a great kid, absolutely gorgeous kid, and we were all just devastated. But also, it was such a beautiful experience to mm. have loved him and learned from him because he was really, really amazing. But obviously, Adam was a big part of our family, and mm. how I felt about Adam was completely different to how Grace or Emer mm-hmm. who would have felt about him. Yeah. So I guess it's true that their grieving is different. Yes, you know, the, absolutely. And yeah. they had different relationship yeah. with him and different memories. And yeah. it's just to allow space for that. Yeah. And definitely, you know, where where I suppose where you don't see if you see like everyone goes into a cru- acute grief first and it's almost intolerable and yeah. like shocking and it's yeah. so physical yeah. like um the losses I felt I've literally had a pain in my heart yeah. and like I I physically feel like I'm having a heart attack yeah. from the pain of this grief like mm. it can be that's very acute and mm. then it tends to dissipate but it doesn't go mm. but I think if you don't see your child moving through that acute phase then it's good to get them some support yeah. and maybe they do need to have a little bit of therapy it can be so transformative yeah. for them yeah. um, just to process the events and to yeah. talk it out and make sense of what happened because it is so confusing Yeah. Um, and I think just to another thing with grief I've noticed with the teenagers I work with they're often not explicit like it's very few teens I work with that will come in and be like oh yeah um, here's how I feel about my mum passing today so if we're open and curious and we've got that strong relationship we'll we'll know what that is when a child says, oh, I really like this song. Do you? Yeah, whatever. Okay. Or, ooh, you love this song, put it on for me. I'm wondering why you love this song. But what yeah. is it about it? There's something in it. Yeah. Do you know, so they're communicating in those kind of ways. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it's so true. And, mm. you know, it is, I guess, be more fluid-like and going with it. Yeah. Because you have to go to their level, don't you? Yeah, that's it. And whatever way they're trying to connect, there's a lot of bids for connection from yeah. children and teenagers that are often missed. Right. Because it's like, well, not now. Or, yeah, well, yeah. But if they're bidding in for a connection or trying to tell you about a song or tell you about someone in school or tell you about a teacher even, yeah, it's there's a reason. Not yeah. always. I mean, maybe it's just want to chat. Maybe it's just a little bit of connection. But yeah. oftentimes it's something that could be missed if we don't get yeah. curious. Yeah. Mm. Some that they probably would like your opinion on, you mm. know, without kind of directly asking you for it. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. And I, I do encourage p- parents to say sometimes as well, like, do you want my opinion? Or do you just want my ears? Right, you know? okay. Because I think like yeah. that when... Oh yeah, they definitely sometimes just want your ears. Yeah. Because the minute you go to give an opinion, they're like, who even asked you? <laughs> <laughs> Not this again. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's good just to check. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and I guess as a mom, not to take that too personal. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I guess from that, what I'm, I'm, the whole thing is, is fluid like and as a concept, it's, it's a journey really. Mm. So I guess you know, to dip into supports. I love the idea, like you spoke about therapy. I love the idea of therapy for teenagers as well, because sometimes it can be that bit mm. more difficult to communicate. And, you know, moms are very, very busy as our dad's people. So maybe just have that neutral setting yeah. where you can dip in. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if a family is grieving, like for pa- parents are grieving too, yeah. then they're not really, you yeah. know, why would they hold that grief to that level? Yeah. Um. So I, I, I'm trained as child and adolescent and my specialism is play therapy, but I would, my play therapy room, I ha- I see a lot of teenagers and they will play and yeah. they will do creative things. So it's often just creative therapy that yeah. really helps um, teens, um, art therapy, things like that, because of, because it's not as intense as just sitting yeah. in a chair talking yeah. and because we use the subconscious and because we use the the somatics in the body. Yeah. So it's a movement or I put on music, we you know, it's mm-hmm. it's amazing how many kids, uh, teenagers will come into my room and pick up the whoopee cushion and pick up <laughs> the silly toys that you're like, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. But they love to play, actually, you know, oh, yeah. and that's that connective, yeah. really, really healing part. Yeah. 
Um, so there's I think it's really hard at the moment to to find a therapist and it's it's difficult. Yeah. There's not enough services, but um, there are good, you know, family centres and yeah. the Irish Cancer Society do free services and yeah. stuff like that. And do you did I see do you do work on Zoom? I do, yeah. Okay, yeah. so tell tell us about that. Tell us about how people will find you and where they where they can find you and what kind of services that you offer. If it is a case that they wanted to dip in and out, um, yeah. So I do. I mainly work with children and teenagers in person, and mm-hmm. I'm full at the moment. Okay. <laughs> but I do work with parents as well. Yeah. So my parent sessions are all on Zoom, and that's Brilliant. parent advice clinic kind of um, parent coaching. And then my webinars and parent information, um, I have it all in a membership and I have my kind of monthly web, uh, webinars. So I, well, that's fantastic because yeah. that's exactly what parents, sometimes they don't want to get in the car and drive for an hour mm. and sit amongst other parents. Sometimes, it, you know, the couple just struggling at this moment and need a bit of help yeah. to get through this. And yeah. then, like I said, there's only a new set of problems just waiting around the corner. <laughs> know, <yeah. laughs> it's great to get the clarity, though, and yeah. to kind of have a sounding board for yeah. those things. I think a lot of the time it's just, um, I love reconnecting a parent with their own intuition and their own that they to kind of let go of self-doubt yeah because a lot of the time it's just a lot of noise but when they tune in they're like actually I do know yeah I do know this stuff I do know how to connect I do know to bring in more play or whatever it is yeah for sure you know again take the power back the answer is always within yeah whenever I struggle I just take a little moment and say be the mum that you needed Karina yeah because it it brings me back to being 12 been back to being 14 actually gas Haley when I was um 14, 15 and 16, I really struggled with my mom, which now as a mom, I can totally understand because she, she had five kids. I was her fourth. She now had a business and she'd seen it all. And like 90% of the time I was trying to pull one, like, you know, and she was like, no, fucking hell, Karina, forget it. <laughs> but I was like, I felt I was dismissed a lot. Mm. So I wrote a daily diary literally every day. No and I have them on, not going to say where, I have them somewhere very safe that no 12 or 14 year old would ever find them. And my idea was that if I was ever that mum and I forgot what a 14 year old or a 12, wow. 15 year old was like, I'd read the diaries. Amazing. Isn't yeah. it? How intuitive that was, of me that at that, that age. To do. Such I just, good information yeah. there. Well, yeah, scary, scary stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now we don't open the diaries and we just hope that maybe their dad's genetics kicked in and <laughs> <laughs> there'll yeah. be balance yeah. <laughs> um, yeah but I, I think it was very intuitive of me at that age but I remember feeling that struggle and, and I was like she hasn't a clue that's mm. what I was thinking about my mum and little, what I actually know, know now is she knew it all yeah. um, but I was thinking she hasn't a clue she doesn't know like it got to a point where we used to communicate by letter because mm. we just get into a row and um, yeah so I wrote those diaries and it had a big uh, it really framed how I the kind of mom I wanted yeah. to be amazing yeah I th- and I think like that whole idea of oh, she doesn't have a clue and I feel yeah. so disconnected or she's not listening to me she dismisses me like that's everything that I'm hearing still from teens in the, in the therapy room really? you know it's, yeah. so it is like that building the relationship and yeah. connection and a lot of parents will say but I don't know how or you know my child doesn't come looking for cuddles or paint yeah. and nails yeah. together and stuff yeah. and um I recently had a parent where this was happening and the, it was a, you know, a really big, tall 18 year old son. Yeah. But we found a play, play to do yeah. because we t- were trying to do the attachment stuff with the eye contact and all for him. Yeah. And they they got sparring um, gloves, gloves and yeah. they did their boxing in the kitchen Brilliant. and they just had such a laugh. But yeah. there's also a lot of rhythm in that. Yeah. And there's the trust and the boundaries yeah. and, you know, too yeah. strong to... Um, it's kind of like the rough and tumble play, really. Yeah. So they were doing that. I had another family doing wood burning. They found the wood burning thing in Lidl and they were creating all these cool. Brilliant. Um, it's just finding something yeah. creative or to do together. Yeah. That, and, you know, working on these little projects. Yeah. Um, I have another family that were watching cat yeah. videos in bed on YouTube, just <laughs> laughing and laughing and laughing. And they were actually bereaved. Such oh, a laugh. <gasps> To just oh, laugh at these silly videos you know, it was like yeah. so healing for them, yeah. you know. So I think you can always find something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's, that, it's okay to be happy, mm. you know. Oh, yeah. You, you know, that, to the allow laugh. yourself yeah. to be. You know, only recently I had this um, experience with Emer, and I was like, well, if that doesn't just sum it up for me. So she'd just come in from Ga, it was very cold. She was full of muck. Um, she was in the bathroom and I said, let's just get a shower first before we have something to eat or whatever. And I was kind of helping her take her clothes off, you know, and I said, mm-hmm. OK, come on, Emer, just. And she said, don't call me Emer, call me baby. <laughs> I, yeah. I was like, baby, come here to me. Come here. She just <laughs> really needed yeah. that. And I just got it. Like yeah, I'm go with it. Yeah, I'm that 
that happens to me yeah. when you just need a cuddle. Like, who doesn't need oh, that? for sure. As yeah. adults, yeah. like, 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. This, you know. uh, I love that she was able to say that and you did it. Yeah. That's yeah. unreal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now it's it's a thing. You know, we kind of like, I'm, I'm like, don't call me mama, call me baby. <laughs> She's like, oh, baby, come here. You just need that. Yeah, yeah 100%. It's, 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 so, um, it's so nurturing, isn't yeah. it? It's just like... Cocoon yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, cocoon me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just, just make me feel safe and comforted. That's it. It's the safe yeah. feeling. And that is ultimately the job as a mum. Because yeah. I've lost my mum now three years and that's what Gosh, I miss yeah. most. Mm. That's the one thing would be if you could ask for anything. I would have probably thought before she passed away, maybe her credit card. Yeah. But now I can safely <laughs> no. say it would be a big cuddle and a hug. And, and that feeling. more than that, just for her to say everything's going to be okay. Yeah, It's all going to be okay. So many times things have happened since I was like, oh, damn. I could really do it ringing you right now. Oh, That's so for hard. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's the power though that I think parents don't realise maybe that they are that person that can yeah. literally make yeah. a child yeah. go oh everything's yeah. okay yeah. I feel safe oh, absolutely just that hug just that yeah. voice just that's mm-hmm. what you can do as mm-hmm. a parent and yeah. that's the relationship yeah. you know it's yeah and you powerful. know if a parent ever says to themselves I, I don't know what they want I don't know what they did I don't, I don't know what it is you do know because mm-hmm. you were 14 you were 15 mm-hmm. you were 8 just yeah. take a bit of time and go back yeah and feel what it feels because it's actually really rough to be yeah. a kid out there. It is. It's yeah. really hard. And it's it's really hard. Like I have kids that tell me they're afraid to feel so angry. They're afraid of their anger. They, they were always in trouble. And, you know, that yeah. eruption in the body, it feels horrible. And, oh, my you know, God, that anxiety. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. It really like when your nervous system is dysregulated, yeah. it's a horrible feeling. So yeah. having that empathy and compassion yeah. for what yeah. they're going through rather than mm. I need them to stop or why are they doing this? You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it is tough. And I think sometimes we can think as parents that they have it easy because they're wrapped up in bed every night and they don't need to worry about bills and they don't (laughs) need to worry about everything else. But it is tough, you know. It's tough. It's it's tough for everyone, but just to acknowledge that and and not dismiss it. Yeah, that's the um, key thing, acknowledging anything that comes up. And it doesn't matter what it is because I remember myself, like, if... um, when I was a kid, like we were, we'd be, we might have had a holiday or we might have had something really nice and then I'd ask for more. Yeah. And this always happens around Christmas. Parents say this to me, okay. you know, it's like it's never enough or I, you just want more. Yeah. It's like you can't be disappointed because you just had McDonald's. You can't yeah. be disappointed that you're not getting ice yeah. cream now on the way home. But they can. Yeah. And children want nice things. So, yes. <laughs> I so can totally relate so to that. So even when you're going, how? Yeah. After Christmas, you've got yeah. all these toys. Yeah. And now you're asking, you're passing the toy shop on, you know, two days after Christmas and you want the Lego. And I said, no, you're crying. You're not allowed to cry over that. But actually they are. And that's yeah. normal. So it's okay. still like, even when it's so, so hard, yeah. still acknowledge that feeling yeah. and say, you really wanted that Lego? Yeah. Doesn't seem fair that I can't get you the Lego. You so wanted. I understand. Oh, we're yeah. not getting that Lego yeah. though. Okay, come yeah. on, let's go. Still acknowledge it, even though you're like, oh. Yeah. You know, and that's the hard part. Yeah, for sure. A lot of people can acknowledge feelings up until a point. Yeah. Up until I don't agree with yeah. that feeling, do you know? And then you could throw in, I feel exactly the same about a Chanel bag. So <laughs> if you want to talk this out, <laughs> let's connect. Let's over connect that. over that. Yeah. <laughs> Ailey, thank you so much for coming by today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And um, where can people find you on it's Hedy? Just tell your eyes on Instagram. Yeah. Simple. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much for your time. Thanks a million. Thank you.